Welcome back to our third session, and that has to do with ratio analysis and writing of financial analysis reports. Now, this session is a follow-up on our previous session. Uh, it adds up in totality to financial analysis. Now, ratio analysis are, or ratios in particular, are powerful tools that help in the interpretation of financial statements and help to discover issues and problems not evidently or not immediately evident from the accounts when we do sometimes what we call the common size analysis or when we have basic uh, numerical information in our financial reports. Now, they helped also with inter-firm comparisons, which allows managers to benchmark the performance of the firm and look at the efficiency alongside its competitors. Now, this session will seek to equip our students with an understanding of what financial ratio analysis is, the calculation of various ratios in the field of finance, and how to use the financial ratios. At the end of the session, we are seeking to get you to understand the ratios, compute those ratios as needed depending on what your goal is, and be able to effectively use these ratios. Now we'll look at it from the performance evaluation perspective and also to look at what determines financial performance and then also how to write a financial analysis report. Now, ratios typically measures relations between two entities using the figure, figures um, allotted to those. So financial ratio analysis use the relationship among financial statement accounts to gauge the financial condition and performance of a firm. Now, depending on the type of information the ratio provides, we can categorize these into what we refer to as profitability ratios, solvency ratios, liquidity ratios, and activity ratios. Now, these in totality give a clearer idea as to the health or the financial health of a firm and give insights into its efficiency in relation to expense management, its debt management, its day-to-day -day cash management issues and liquidity elements, and how effectively and efficiently it is putting its assets to use in generating its financial goals. Now, we have activity and efficiency ratios to start with. Now, when it comes to activity and efficiency ratios, we are looking at the number of times a particular item has been turned around within the fiscal year, and for that reason, whether the turnover is good or it's not good in relation to that. Now, for turnover elements that look at efficiency, we can look at inventory turnover, receivables turnover, total asset turnover, and working capital turnover. Now, inventory turnover typically looks at how well a firm is able to turn over its inventory within a particular accounting year. Normally reflected as a cost of goods sold divided by the inventory, this metric begins to measure how efficiently a particular or the firm's average inventory is rolled over in an accounting year because every time inventory is sold, that is what is translated to be reported as cost of goods sold. So the more inventory sold in a year, given how much a firm orders maybe at any point in time, will tell us how efficiently or how well the firm is able to move its inventory from the storehouse. Now, this turnover ratio can actually give insights from two different angles. On one side, if the turnover ratio is huge, Given that the denominator is average inventory, it may very well mean that the firm stocks very little inventory, so it's able to turn over the inventory quickly to generate cost of goods sold. On the, so when that happens, what it means is the firm may be wasting a lot of funds on daily basis or on periodic basis, ordering new inventory when it could order enough inventory at a go. Now, with, when inventory turnover is high, what it means is that when you divide the number of days in a year by the inventory turnover ratio, what you end up with is what we'll call inventory holding period. Now, this measures to a large extent how long inventory stays in the warehouse before it is sold. The shorter the period, the better because it translates into less capital being tied up in the inventory, less opportunity for obsolescence and 
spoilage of goods, especially if you're dealing in perishable goods and what have you. The same principle applies to inventory uh, receivables turnover. Now, with receivables turnover, it means how well you are able to turn over or move and roll over your receivables. That's your debtors group. Now, if you're able to roll over debtors quickly, what it means is that your money does not stay too long with your debtors before you collect them. On one hand, this could be good because it means that you do not lose value either through um, depreciation of the currency or etc. because of when you take longer to collect, there's a high incidence of bad debt as well. Then the same holds for total asset turnover, which also then helps us to look at how much revenue we are generating in relation to the assets that we hold. In some cases, this may be an indication that maybe the firm has got too much assets on its hands given the amount of revenue it's able to generate. And insights into that could lead, very well lead, to appropriate downsizing of the firm to give it the most efficient or effective ratio between its total revenue and its total assets. And the same principle holds for working capital turnover. Now let's look at liquidity. As the term clearly states, when something is liquid, it has to do with the flow. So liquidity is usually about having access to cash or is allied or related entities like uh, near cash, like securities, T-bills, and etc. Now, because liquidity is the firm's ability to satisfy short-term debt obligations without stress by having assets that can easily be converted to cash. To look at a firm's liquidity, we could look at the current ratio, which normally measures as current assets divided by current liabilities. A one-to-one -one may be the minimum, but depending on industry, you could have bigger values like two. In essence, it means that for every current liability we have, there's a two in the, in the value of current assets, which means short-term assets to pay out. Now, because current assets also encompass inventory, sometimes there's a need to go a step further to look at the firm's real ability to settle such obligations by looking at what we call the quick ratio. Now that takes away inventory from the current assets value and still divides it by the current liability of the firm. Ability or a value greater than one usually means that even in the absence of inventory, which can sometimes take much longer to sell, the firm is in a good position to settle its uh, short-term liabilities. And then we also have the cash ratio, which looks at cash and near cash items to be able to settle a firm's current liabilities. We move on to solvency, which is a more significant version, or should I say a related version to liquidity. Whilst liquidity looks at ability to meet short-term debt obligations, solvency has to do with meeting much more longer-term debt obligations and looks at the use of a firm's debt within its um, operating scenario. Now, when it comes to solvency ratio, we look at issues such as debt to total assets. Now, this typically tells us what proportion of our assets is financed with debt. Now, if a huge proportion of a firm's assets is financed with debt, it makes that firm prone to financial distress because there may come a time when interest payments will far outweigh the revenue propensity of that firm and that could immediately lead to bankruptcy. Aside from total debt, you can also look at long-term debt to just look at how much of the long-term debt component is in relation to total assets. And then you can also look at debt to equity ratio. Now this looks at the relativity between debt financing in relation to total shareholders equity. Now a value greater than one means that there's more debt within the firm than there is equity. So then it means that the firm is more owned by outsiders than insiders. And then you can also have the term we refer to as an equity multiplier or sometimes referred to as financial leverage, which begins to look at the total assets of the firm divided by the shareholders' equity. Now, this literally looks at how many times equity must be multiplied to attain the total assets of a firm.
If equity is quite small in relation to total assets, it means financial leverage is high and like the total debt ratio, this is sometimes an indication of the firm's propensity to go into bankruptcy in the near future. We have other coverage ratios such as interest coverage that looks at the firm's ability to service its interest payments given its operating profits and also service other obligations given its operating profits and other cash flows. Now these ratios, especially in relation to solvency, is what will determine a firm that is capable of surviving into the future and one that is not capable of surviving into the future. Then we now look at profitability. Obviously, every firm is into business one way or the other to achieve profits. Now, profits typically is the difference between revenue and expense. So once we make some good profits, intrinsically it means that we are making some good inroads as far as um, cost efficiency is concerned. So we've got gross profit margin, which normally looks at gross profits to total revenue. And that usually is after you have taken out direct costs, such as cost of goods sold. Now, this may be an indication or an indicator to tell you whether your source of goods for transmitting onto your customers is too expensive or your production line is costing too much, such that between your total revenue and your cost of goods sold, your gross profit is quite minimal. You also have operating profit margin, which looks at other elements that are not uh, interest or your non-finance implications of other expenses, meaning that after direct elements have taken, been taken out, other issues like utilities, wages, and salaries, once taken out, will bring you to operating profit. Now, your ability to manage the cost within those elements may also translate into good operating profit margins, and that is usually a plus for any organization. Now, the last item we could look at, even though there are a number of other operating prof or profit margin components you could look at, is net profits. Typically between sales and net profits, all other items within the income statement are expense items. So then, between sales and net profit, if your expense items are not well managed, this may translate into very tiny or, if possible, even negative profit margins which is not good for any firm that is seeking to maximize wealth now here we have a graph looking at the revenue and profit over time for google from 2004 through to 2009 you see the trend in terms of the red portion being revenue and the yellow portion being profit now if you look closely from 2007 through to 2008 Whilst revenue was rising, profits had stabilized. What it meant was that expenses were probably rising faster than the revenue, for which reason profits did not rise with the same pattern as revenue. But then by 2008 through to 2009, this procedure or this one was reverted. Now that could be the possibility that they did look at their financials and based on what they unearthed as the driver of this changed pattern, they were able to rectify the issues at hand and then restore the trend such that with revenue increasing, profits were also what increasing. Now, when it comes to profitability ratios, apart from the margins, we could look at returns. Now, typically that looks at the measure of profit we've made in relation to the investment that we put up. Now we can have operating return on assets, which looks at operating income over total assets. We look at return on assets, which looks at net income over total assets. We look at return on capital, which is looking at net income over interest bearing debt over total equity. We can have return on equity, that means net income over shareholders' equity. And then operating return on assets, which looks at operating income over total assets which i've already mentioned now all these actually tell us how well we are doing in relation to the capital or the investments we have put up in relation to our business agenda now if these values do not look good it is time for the firm to take a second look at its operations and then begin to make the relevant adjustments
Now, beyond that, there's a way to even begin to break down the return of an investment, or let's say a return on equity in particular, or a return on assets, into components that begin to look at it from different viewpoints. We have, for example, the DuPont formula that begins to look at, let's say, return on equity by looking at it from a three-point framework or the potential of a five-point framework. Now, return on equity is captured as net profit margin multiplied by the total asset turnover. And what we have already mentioned in our previous slides in terms of ratios, the financial leverage, or we we'll call the equity multiplier. Now, intrinsically, when we look at net profit margin, by splitting return on equity into this three-point framework, we can realize that return on equity is actually being fooled by three components. Expense management, which is readily measurable using our net profit margin. Our efficiency in using our total assets to generate income or revenue. And then how much borrowing we have done over time. Now, when you split into these three components, it gives you an even better idea so that you do not just look at block in terms of unblock the return on equity, but rather the components that drive them. And for that reason, you are able to make targeted moves to address relevant issues therein. So here we are showing the various ways or the breakdowns you can have for the DuPont model. When we start with return on equity, it is the leverage multiplied by the return on assets, which is then further broken down into components. So finally, when we move on to the five points, it means we are looking at our equity multiplier, multi we are looking at our total asset turnover, we are looking at our expense management, and then we are looking at our operating tax environment. So that together works to tell us how well we are faring, and if possible, where the actual issues are and how they could be addressed. So we have an example that you could work through on your own. And then we finally look at one that I didn't capture fully in the previous slides because it applies mostly to listed firm and that has to do with market ratios. You could look at earnings per share. You could look at book values per share, PE ratios. Now these ratios are typically very relevant in making decisions for listed firms and it helps in making a decision as to whether to invest or not to invest based on these ratios. Now, thank you very much for your time. Now, in understanding ratios, you should know that ratios are typically figures. So they are indicators, not necessarily solutions. They are indicators of potential problems. For, so for effective use of ratios, you must look beyond the figures to understand what could trigger those figures. Now, it's more effective when you look at those ratios over time, compare them with other firms within the same line of business. That way you know whether you're performing quite well or you're not doing so well. And in the context of major events, as in when significant changes have happened within the business, you want to know how your ratios have improved or deteriorated as a result of that. Now, for the purposes of making it more meaningful for management decision making, it's important that it may be put in a comprehensive financial analysis report, which will focus on the strengths identified, the weaknesses, and how to look at making the most of that. Now, of course, for the reports, the basics will look at the executive summary, which looks at the important findings from the analysis. You look at the introduction to tell you the objectives for which the report it's being written and also you look at the various components that need to go into it analyzing each under a particular heading and you conclude the report by projecting what the future performance may look like and how issues identified within the analysis could be rectified thank you and enjoy the next session